Friends, today I got a story for you that most of you haven't heard and by the end of it you'll probably think I didn't want to hear it but it's my job to call out those who commit the worst crimes. Today's story will focus on a woman who tried to frame her husband in the murder of her three children. This is the story of Dora Luz Buenrostro. So grab your coffee, get your cookies or whatever fat snacks you like to eat. My name is Cameron. Let's get into it. Dora and Alex were married in 1982 until their separation several years later. They lived in Los Angeles, California with their three children. Their children were called Susanna, Vicente and Deirdre. And a quick disclaimer, I could not find a single image of these children. The image you see on the thumbnail is a stock image. Forgive me. Alex worked as an auto refinisher painter. Dora herself worked for seven years as a file clerk and interpreter for a law firm. Now in 1990, Dora moved with the children to San Jacinto in Riverside County. Alex himself remained in Los Angeles and he saw the children twice a month. Now between 5 and 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 1994, Dora was seen driving in her car with her three children. Around 6.30 p.m., Dora borrowed $10 from a neighbor. The neighbor's name was David Tejerina. She told David she needed the money for gas. And to be fair, if you need to go to your neighbor to borrow gas money, times must be hard. Ironically, $10 today in gas will get you from here to here. She told David she was going to drive to Los Angeles to see her husband. Tejerina watched Dora drive out of the apartment complex with Deidre in the car. Dora arrived at Alex's residence in Los Angeles. She came alone and unannounced about 11 p.m. and she stayed for two hours. She then asked to see Alex's gun. Alex is all confused. He removed the bullets and he showed her his gun. Then he put it away. He was then worried and he asked Dora, hey, where are the children? She told him, oh, the children are fine. Don't worry. Then at some point, Dora went to the kitchen and then approached Alex who was in the bedroom. She was holding a steak knife and wearing a red glove. She made stabbing motions with the knife and asked Alex, why are you afraid of dying? Because he had never given her the separation she supposedly wanted. Alex, all scared, he called 911. Dora swings at him with the knife a couple of times, but he was able to get away and he ran outside. Police then arrived within 20 minutes at 11.15 a.m. Dora was standing in the doorway of the residence holding the knife, but complied when police commanded her to drop it. She told police she was there to pick up her child. She then accused Alex of taking the child to buy shoes earlier in the day and not returning. The police, however, observed there was no child at the residence or in Dora's car. She had a dark colored four door Oldsmobile. The car also did not have a child's car seat in it, which is very important information. I'll come back to that. The police advised her to return to San Jacinto and file a missing child report. She then decides to leave. Now, on Wednesday, October the 26th, 1994, about 10 30 a.m., Dora went to the San Jacinto police department and reported to officer Blaine Dillon. She said that her estranged husband had taken her youngest child two days earlier and did not bring the child back. The officer informed her that law enforcement could not intervene unless her husband was in violation of a court order providing he was not permitted to visit with the child. Dora then left the police department. Later that day, around 2 p.m., Dora's sister, Angela Montenegro, saw her at a gas station in San Jacinto. Dora was alone and driving her Oldsmobile, which had been washed and had water dripping from the back bumper. Neither Deirdre nor the child's car seat was in the car. Around 3 p.m., Dora met with her neighbor, Velia Cabinilla. She saw Susanna and Vicente when they stopped briefly to play at her apartment after school. The children told Cabanilla their mother had told them Deirdre 
was with their father. So at this point, Deidre is missing, but the other two children, their whereabouts are accounted for. Deidre had visited Cabanilla's apartment the day before by herself. Now around 7pm, another neighbour saw Dora looking over the wall of her apartment. Cabanilla's and Dora's apartment shared a common wall. On Thursday, October the 27th, 94, around 3am, Cabanilla heard a really loud thump, but no other noise coming from Dora's living room. At 6.40am, Dora entered the San Jacinto Police Department. She reported to the desk clerk that her husband was at her apartment with a knife. The police were immediately dispatched. The officers entered the apartment and found two of Dora's children, Susanna and Vicente, lying on separate sofas in the living room, each covered as if sleeping. Both were dead, with stab wounds to their necks. Another sofa was standing on its end at the entrance of the hallway, blocking the path to the bedrooms and bathrooms. Dora admitted she had moved the sofa. Outside, Dora told police Alex had come to the apartment that morning. She let him in and he went to the bathroom. Dora did think he was acting strange, so she went to the police station to notify the police of his behaviour. The San Jacinto Police Department Sergeant Frederick Rodriguez was assigned as lead investigator. At the police station, he interviewed Dora, who was not in custody. Meanwhile, police focused their investigation on Alex, simply because she told them, he's come to my house and he's acting all weird. By 9am, police located him at the office of his employer in Los Angeles and took him into police custody for questioning. By early the next morning, the police ruled him out as a suspect and released him from custody. Later, around 6 p.m., Deirdre's body was discovered by children playing in an abandoned post office in Lakeview. A deputy with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene and saw Deirdre strapped in a child's car seat. Now you know why the car seat was missing from Dora's car. There was blood and visible trauma to her mouth and neck. An object with a handle, possibly a screwdriver or pen knife, was stuck in her throat. Officer Dillon arrived at the scene about 7.30pm to investigate. He had received information about the investigation from other officers during the course of the day. Based on inconsistencies in Dora's version of events, police focused on her as a suspect. You see, Dora was removed from her apartment complex and processed for evidence. Her purse and camera case and a red knit glove were discovered in the trunk of the car. DNA testing established that six blood samples obtained from Dora's car matched Deirdre's DNA profile. Dora, Alex, Susanna and Vicente were eliminated as sources for the blood. Hairs found on Deirdre's hand and leg were determined to be similar to Dora. Tire impressions lifted from an area near the abandoned post office where Deirdre's body was found. It matched the tread designs of the three different types of tires on Dora's car. All three children bled to death from multiple stab wounds to the neck. Susanna suffered defensive wounds to her right hand, four stab wounds to the front of her neck, two of which went into the bone of her spine, superficial cuts to her neck and a perforation of her left chest cavity. What on earth happened to this young girl, eh? The stab wounds ranged in depth from 1 to 3 inches. One stab wound severed the left subclavian artery and another cut halfway through the external jugular vein. These two injuries caused exceedingly rapid bleeding and likely rendered Susanna unconscious in less than a minute. Vicente suffered numerous defensive wounds on his hands, two stab wounds to the front of his neck and abrasions and contusions on his neck and right clavicle. One of the stab wounds cut almost completely through the right common carotid artery, which comes from the heart. Vicente died from rapid bleeding, which likely rendered him unconscious in less than a minute. Deirdre died from multiple stab wounds to her neck, 
a piece of a knife blade three quarters of an inch wide by two or three inches in length had broken off and was embedded in the bone in her neck area. A metallic tip of what appeared to be a ballpoint pen was found in the soft tissue of her neck. Deirdre has suffered a perforation of the chest cavity and blunt force trauma to her skull, which was consistent with her head being pushed against the car seat whilst the knife was being inserted. There were no defensive wounds on her body. Deirdre's body exhibited signs of decomposition. The time of her death could not be determined. So given the inconsistencies of Dora's story, police had her as the prime suspect. We now move on to the beginning of the trial, the preliminary hearings. During these hearings, Dora testified in her own defense. On direct examination, she testified that the last time she saw Deirdre was 9 or 10 a.m. on Tuesday, October the 25th, 1999, when Alex came to her apartment and took her. Between 11 a.m. and noon, Dora went to the Sam Jacinto Police Department to report Deirdre missing. At 11 p.m. that night, Dora drove to Alex's residence in Los Angeles and checked the house for Deirdre. She claimed that she picked up a knife to defend herself during an argument with Alex. So Alex said, she picked up a knife and attacked me. She's now claiming, no, 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 he attacked me and I was defending myself. She then threatened him but did not try to stab him and she denied that she wore a red glove on her hand. Alex called the LA police department and Dora dropped her knife when ordered to do so. She complained to police that Alex had taken Deirdre and had not returned her. When the police advised her to leave, she left and returned to San Jacinto. The following morning, Dora went to the San Jacinto Police Department seeking assistance regarding Deirdre's disappearance. Dora testified that at 5 a.m. on Thursday morning, October the 27th, 94, Alex came to her apartment. She let him in. He went straight to the bathroom. Dora left the apartment because of the Tuesday evening altercation with him in LA. She left Susanna and Vicente in the apartment. She then went to the police department between 5.30 and 6.30 a.m. She told the police that she had an argument with Alex on Tuesday and that he had taken her daughter. She asked them to check her apartment and speak with Alex. So you get what she's trying to say in terms of the timeline? She went to Alex's house. They had a bit of a scuffle. She leaves. She goes home. Alex then comes over. They have another scuffle. She gets scared and she goes to the police. But the important bit of information she gives is that the children are at home with him at the time. When she's at the police, she asks them to check her apartment and speak with Alex. Dora said he did not have a knife or another weapon. Dora returned to her apartment complex with the police and waited outside. Now at 7.30 a.m., she was informed her children were dead. So the question remains, was Alex really there? If not, what happened to her children? But you can get her timeline, right? If she's trying to be disingenuous, she's trying to place him at the crime scene when the children are found. Dora went to the police department where she remained all day for questioning. She denied killing the children, claiming someone had planted the blood evidence in her car. She had no explanation for the tire impressions that matched the tires on her car and said the red gloves found in the passenger compartment and trunk of her car belonged to Betty Benrostro, who was a family member. Dora admitted having a prior felony conviction for grand theft. Now in February 95, while awaiting trial in this case, Dora has a physical altercation with Deputy Johnny Anaya. She also had an altercation with a nurse who was administering medications to inmates housed on the medical floor in the jail. The altercation occurred when Dora stepped outside her cell. She refused an order to return to her cell and raised her hand to the deputy and nurse. Dora grabbed the nurse and when her hand slipped, held tightly onto her sleeve. Anaya forced Dora back into her cell. The deputy and Dora struggled, fell to the floor and struggled further before other deputies subdued Dora. Then another incident occurred in May 96. Deputy Stephanie Rigby was supervising inmates at the jail and permitted Dora to leave the day room. 
Dora walked into a sally port area and removed a ringer from a custodial mop bucket. Observing her from a glass enclosed control room, Deputy Rigby commanded her to return to the day room. Dora refused to comply and held the mop ringer over her shoulder like a baseball bat. When she refused to drop the ringer, backup deputies were called to assist. A deputy had to physically remove the ringer from her grip. Dora did not attempt to hit any of the deputies with the ringer. Seems to me Dora had a few screws loose. Now at some point during the trial, the prosecution presented the testimony of the victim's older half-sister, Alejandro Benrostro, their father, Alex Benrostro, and Deborah DeForge, the principal of the elementary school Susanna and Vicente attended. The prosecution played a videotape of Alex at the police station showing the moment he learned Susanna and Vicente had been murdered. The prosecution also presented a video montage of photographs and the victims in life and their shared grave site. Dora testified on her own behalf and she claimed she had been framed by the police in general. She said that Officer Blaine Dillon, in particular, whom she accused of having lied about the timeline of events and planting the incriminating evidence in her car. You see, in her view, the expert had testified the hairs found on Deidre could have belonged to anyone. She then denied being mentally ill. And the reason why she's being so stupid is because you're a nobody. Nobody is going to randomly plant blood in your car of the victim. And then the police are not going to randomly go against you. I know in certain stories that has been the case, but it doesn't seem to be the case in this story. Dora maintained her innocence of the charges and wanted to be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole because she had been framed. That to me is very key. You want to know why? Because if you feel like you've been framed, if you think you're innocent, you don't want to go to jail at all. However, why was she okay with life in prison? You want to know why? Because the crime in question, the punishment, was a death penalty. So with that in mind, life in prison is not so bad. The defense also presented testimony from Dora's former neighbor, David Tejerina, her niece, Brenda Davalos, and sisters Martha Gudino and Maria Perez, and their mother, Arcelia Zamudio. The evidence briefly sketched Dora's family background and portrayed her as a loving mother and related a change in her attitude and behavior in the months preceding the murders. Another, another question there is, well, why did you need a change of attitude? What was wrong with you, huh? Now, going back to the preliminary hearings, before the trial, the trial court declared a doubt as to Dora's competence to stand trial and suspended the criminal proceedings. And that makes sense because, like I said, this woman seems a bit crackers. So, at the competency trial, defense experts, psychologists Michael Perotti and Michael Kania and psychiatrist Mark Mills testified that Dora was not competent to stand trial. You see, co-appointed experts, psychiatrist Jose Moral and psychologist Craig Rath, they testified that she was competent. So the defense said she's crazy. The prosecution said, no, no, no. Yeah, she's a little bit crazy, but she's not that crazy. The question is, who was right and who was wrong? So we start with psychologist Michael Perotti. He spent 10 hours administering psychological tests and evaluating Dora in March and July 95. Dora related to Dr. Perotti that she had a ninth grade education and had been physically abused by her husband. Regarding her current circumstances, she reported that everyone was against her. Jail deputies conspired against her. She was being poisoned by a gas leak in her jail cell. She claimed she was hearing voices and acting aggressively to the point that she had to be handcuffed. And the medical staff at the jail was conducting experiments on her for research purposes. Dora appeared depressed and confused. Her thoughts were disorganized and her speech pressured. She suffered from significant impairment of memory and concentration caused by a mental disorder. Dr. Perotti also believed there was a possibility of a neuropsychological problem. Perotti did not perform neuropsychological testing because Dora would not cooperate. Perotti said 
Dora did not understand the legal system and had no insight into her lack of understanding. Everything with Dora was clouded with suspicion, distrust and that people were acting against her. He said all of this hindered her ability to work with her attorney or any attorney for that regard. Dora was aware of the murder charges against her but denied knowing who the victims were. She wanted to go to court so she could be released and return home. Perotti diagnosed Dora as a paranoid schizophrenic. That bit right there, that conclusion from the doctor, paranoia, delusion, schizophrenia, kind of makes sense. However, Perotti did not include this diagnosis in his written report because he believed a description of Dora, behavior and her problems was easier to understand than a diagnostic label and had not used the label paranoid schizophrenic with regard to Dora except with trial counsel. Over the course of Dr. Perotti's evaluation of Dora, trial counsel would occasionally ask him, do you think she's a schizophrenic? And he went on to say that his diagnosis of Dora as a paranoid schizophrenic did not necessarily mean that she was incompetent. Based on the test results, Dr. Perotti found no sign that Dora was malingering. In other words, that she was faking it. We now move on to the other psychologist, Michael Kania. He met with Dora on six or seven occasions before he evaluated her for competency during his visits on March the 3rd and April the 17th, 1995. He administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. This is also known as MMPI. He did this on December the 17th, 1994. He explained that although this psychological test is not relevant to the issue of competency, a determination of malingering can be made based on a comparison of test results to the clinician's impressions. Dr. Kenya found no evidence Dora malingered on the MMPI. In other words, he did not think she was faking it till she made it. He acknowledged Dora's scores had been evaluated by Dr. Alex Colwell's testing service, which produced a report stating her answers. This suggested extensive intentional overstatement and some degree of deliberate malingering. The report also included a warning to use caution in interpreting Dora's test results because she did not answer all of the items. So based on his interviews with Dora, Dr. Kania diagnosed her as suffering from delusional disorder with paranoid delusions. For example, Dora thought her sister spoke a different language and had been influencing her children in this language. She also believed gas was being pumped into her jail cell. He concluded she was incompetent to stand trial but she did understand the nature of the charges against her and had a basic understanding of the legal proceedings she could not rationally assist counsel. You then have the psychiatrist Mark Mills. He met with Dora on November the 16th, 1994 and April the 27th, 1995 for a total of two hours. He questioned whether she had been forthcoming during the interviews and believed she may have been paranoid but hiding symptoms. Dora discussed her delusions with family members and others but refused to talk with him about them. He diagnosed her as suffering from a significant psychotic disorder, probably a delusional disorder, because her diagnosis rendered her unable to work rationally with any attorney and believed her to be incompetent to stand trial. We move on to February the 26th, 1995. Riverside County Mental Health Department staff psychiatrist Herminio Academia treated Dora at the jail for about 20 minutes. And with all due respect, if a psychiatrist has a last name called Academia, he's the one to go and see. Dora was complaining that her cell was too hot. She was being cooked and gas was going to her cell. Dr. Academia diagnosed Dora with a non-specific psychotic disorder and prescribed Haldol to relieve her delusions and paranoia, but she refused the medication. On February the 27th, 1995, Riverside County Department of Mental Health staff psychiatrist Austin Anthony treated Dora. She spoke in a rambling manner about the room being hot and about the smell of gas. She appeared friendly and cooperative 
and had good eye contact, but on occasion seemed confused and bewildered. She refused to take medication prescribed for her. On February the 28th, 1995, Dr. Anthony's last appointment with Dora, he found her to be friendly and alert and no longer complaining of the gas smell. Dora's sister, Angela Montenegro, Martha Gudino and Maria Perez described her delusions and bizarre behavior. For example, Montenegro testified that in July 94, when she and her two children were living with Dora and her three children, Dora came home one day from church and took the tacos the children were eating. She threw the tacos in the garbage and told Montenegro to move out. On several occasions during the next month, Dora accused Montenegro of feeding Dora's children poisoned taco meat. This may be a sign of the paranoid delusions the psychiatrists were referring to. Montenegro also said that her sister accused her of being a witch and turning into a snake and biting her leg. On cross-examination, Montenegro testified she and Dora had attended the same church. But what's interesting about this is that the church asked her to quit attending the services because of a relationship she had with a man named Roberto. Now, in this case, it's unclear why she did what she did. However, if you look at the scenario, her husband and her, there's friction. They're not living together. Maybe she had an affair with this guy, Roberto, and then maybe she was pissed off that he would not accept her back. And then maybe to get back at her husband or ex-husband, she decided to murder her children. Silly cow, this was all your own fault. Montenegro also testified that Dora accused her of being a prostitute. Montenegro told police that Dora's anger and name calling might have had something to do with this Roberto individual. Her other sister, Gudino, visited Dora at the jail with another sister, Perez, and their mother. Trial counsel was also present during the visit and asked Gudino to persuade Dora to sign medical information release authorization forms for any medical provider who treated Dora during her life. For about an hour and 45 minutes, Gudino, Perez and their mother tried to persuade Dora to sign the forms. She refused and told her family that they were against her. We now move on to the prosecution's evidence. They had their own co-appointed psychiatrist, Jose Morrell, on March 25, 1995, examined Dora at the jail. She was alert and oriented and understood the purpose of his visit. She knew she had been charged with murdering her children. She demonstrated knowledge and understanding of the criminal legal process, including the various stages from arrest through trial and sentencing. Before having her children, she had been employed at a civil law firm as an assistant to the legal secretaries and worked with attorneys for about seven years. Dora complained the proceedings were progressing too slowly. She denied having delusions or hallucinations and exhibited no psychotic symptoms during the interview. On July the 26th, 1995, Dr. Morrell interviewed Dora a second time. Dora again demonstrated knowledge of the legal system. Her relationship with counsel had improved by this time. She explained that her preoccupation with the smell of gas in her cell stemmed from news reports about deaths in Riverside caused by exposure to gas fumes. She denied having the psychotic symptoms reported by other psychologists and psychiatrists and gave Dr. Morrell reasonable explanations for the reported symptoms. He said Dora had no thought disorder. She was able to carry out her interview with Dr. Morrell without difficulty and was purposeful in her answers, cooperative, reasonable and logical. Dr. Morrell believed Dora was competent to stand trial. Now during a break in the proceedings on the day Morrell testified, he interacted with Dora and discussed competency issues with her. After this contact, Morrell continued to believe Dora was competent to stand trial. Psychologist Craig Rath was appointed on March 14, 1995 
to evaluate Dora's competence to stand trial. You see, previously on October the 28th, 94, at the request of the Riverside District Attorney's Office, Rath had interviewed Dora for about an hour after her arrest. He taped the interview and the audio tape was played for the jury in its entirety. Dora's demeanour during the interview was appropriate. She exhibited no signs of mental illness or psychosis, putting her out of contact with reality. Dora's long-term and short-term memory were unimpaired. She communicated very well and protected information she did not want to share. Dr. Rath administered the MMPI to Dora. She completed 400 of 566 questions. Her answers showed a sore tooth profile, which is a classic sign of malingering. After Dr. Rath was appointed by the court to evaluate Dora's competency, he unsuccessfully attempted to evaluate Dora on March 24th, 95, and then on April 3rd, 1995. Based on his October 28th, 94 interview with her shortly after the murders, Dr. Rath believed she was competent to stand trial because she did not have any major mental illness, would preclude her from understanding what's going on or cooperating with her attorney. Now, the defense did claim that Dr. Roth has a conflict of interest. Imagine this scenario. When the murder happens, he just so happened to be the doctor who evaluated Dora there and then. He then became the doctor to evaluate Dora some few years later during the trial. They feel like because he was preconditioned, because he had preconceived notions and evaluated her before, that he would not be logical. He would have biases against her. But the district attorney's office did not declare a conflict when the court appointed him. They rendered his opinion to be valid, as well as him saying that she's competent to stand trial. You see, Rath denied he had a conflict under the Board of Medical Quality Assurance Ethics Committee. He testified he had contacted the committee and was told, you haven't done anything wrong. Dr. Rath pointed out it would have been unethical for him to refuse to see her, given she was potentially suicidal after the death of her three children. Now, between October 28, 94 and March 1, 95, jail psychiatrist Romeo Villar saw Dora several times while she was in custody. During his last contact with her in March 95, Dora denied having hallucinations or suicidal ideations. Dr. Villar testified that Dora had fair insight and judgment, and her effect was subdued. Catherine Moreno, a paralegal employed by trial counsel, had contact with Dora approximately 10 times by the time she testified at the competency trial. Moreno testified that Dora could not structure coherent paragraphs, although Moreno could not recall ever having read anything done by Dora. Moreno had never tried to talk with Dora about the facts of her case. Dora refused Moreno's numerous requests to sign forms to authorize the release of information and failed to provide any explanation. Moreno acknowledged she could have obtained the documents with a subpoena. We then move on to Sherry Skidmore, a clinical and forensic psychologist who had served on local, state and national psychological ethics committees. She reviewed the results of the MMPI test Dr. Rath administered to Dora. She said, based on those scores, she could not render an opinion as to whether or not Dora was malingering, you know, faking it. In her opinion, no psychologist would determine malingering from MMPI results alone. A determination of malingering depends on a number of objective measures, including a follow-up interview to clarify specific parts of the malingering assessment, such as distortion and over-reporting of symptoms. For a forensic psychologist to render an opinion regarding an individual's competence based on an interview not conducted for the purposes of determining competence would fall below the standard of care. We move on to October the 27th, 95. George Groth, a mental health clinician at the jail, saw Dora at her request. Dora was anxious about her upcoming trial. I wonder why that was, eh? Groth found Dora thinking clear and her speech understandable and she exhibited no signs of mental illness. The party stipulated 
This was the only time Dora was seen by the jail's forensic mental health unit between September 1st, 1995 and the day her competency trial commenced in October of 95. The parties also stipulated that on November 1st, 1995, a jail search warrant was served in Dora's jail cell. They found two documents written by Dora in Spanish and it was confiscated during the search. Now, going to the actual trial itself, the only defense witness to testify during the week-long trial was Dora herself. During the closing arguments, Deputy District Attorney Michael Socio described Dora as a serial killer who planned the killings to hurt Alex and then tried to frame him. He said there is an evil and viciousness in her. Then the defense attorney, Michael Maker, in his closing arguments said the killings were not a premeditated act and that attempts to pin the case on someone else was a pathetic excuse that came to mind. There was no planning here, Maker said, urging the panel to return with a second degree murder conviction if they did not believe Dora's testimony. And then eventually, on October the 2nd, 1998, Dora was found guilty and sentenced to death for the stabbing of her three children. What a nutcase, eh? Again, my theory on her and her husband having an affair could be completely wrong. I don't know. Either way, the fact that she tried to pin it on him, that's disgraceful. And imagine if she succeeded. Imagine if she was some kind of mastermind, Alex would be in jail right now. But if we stay with the theory that she wanted to get back at her husband, what the fuck is that shit? If a relationship doesn't work, whether it's your fault or their fault, you know the best way to get back at someone is to succeed yourself. They say in life, you should not hold on to hate and you should not hold on to the pains of the past. But if you're going to, then use it as motivation to better yourself, not to bring your husband down and murder your children, you fucking moron. I don't know about you guys, but I always get pissed off when I read this shit. When I hear stories, right, particularly when it's relationship oriented, right? Oh, he didn't want me. Oh, he doesn't love me anymore. Oh, he won't take me back. Who cares? The fact that you were weak and pathetic enough to do that to your children is nothing to do with your husband. Paranoid, delusional or not. She deserved the death penalty. Comment, tell me what you think.